This is Nightmare in Wisconsin. The trial of Taylor Shabisness. Accusations of first-degree intentional homicide, strangulation, mutilation, dismemberment, and necrophilia. We bring you raw, unfiltered courtroom audio from the trial of Taylor Shabisness. Nightmare in Wisconsin. Your Honor, I've had a, an extended time period. I appreciate it to talk to my client. We've talked about this prior to trial, but we talked again about it today. I've advised her that she has an absolute right to testify if she wishes, and she also has a right to not testify if she so chooses. I've given her advice. I've conferred with her. We've talked about this particular issue. Um, it's her decision uh, not to testify and exercise her right to remain silent. Okay. And, um, then um, I'll engage her in a colloquy about that in just a minute. But Mr. Fralick, um, then it would be my understanding that um, that you have no more witnesses what you indicated before, and that you'd be when the jury comes back in, you'll be resting. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Then, Mr. Business, I need to address you personally. So. Um, your attorney told me that he just spoke with you about uh, some of your constitutional rights that are coming up right now, and those rights are that you have an absolute right to testify, and you have an absolute right not to testify. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. The, uh, Mr. Fray, I like the microphone. Not oh, yours, sorry. hers. Sorry about that. Um, so, Mr. Business, um, those rights belong to you. They don't belong to Mr. Fralick. They don't belong to the state. They don't belong to me. Those rights belong to you and you alone. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, my understanding from listening to Mr. Fralick is that you've decided that you would like to exercise your right not to testify. Is that correct? That is. Okay. Um, now, I know you've spoken with your attorney. Do you feel you need any more time to talk to your attorney about that decision? No, I do not. Um, has anybody made any threats or promises to you to get you to, to uh, make that decision here today? No. Okay. Any further inquiry you'd like me to make, um, Mr. Lize or Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fralick, any further inquiry you'd like me to make of your client regarding that uh, decision? Uh, just uh, inquire if there's been any pressure on her. Okay. Mr. Business, has anybody placed any kind of pressure on you to make that decision? No. Okay. All right. Well, I'm satisfied uh, based upon the conversation that I've, I've had here with Ms. Business that, um, number one, she understands her rights. She has both of the rights to testify and to not testify. The issue, of course, being you can't exercise both of those rights at the same time. You can only choose one. She's choosing the right not to testify here today. I'm satisfied that she's done that after consulting with her attorney. They took uh, a little bit of extra time. I gave them uh, better than 10 minutes to speak about that. That was the amount of time that Mr. Freilich wanted, and they were back here when I came into court. So they've had an opportunity to discuss that. Ms. Shabiznes has indicated to me she doesn't need any more time to speak with her attorney about that decision. And I'm satisfied that her decision is freely, voluntarily, and intelligently made here today. Of course, uh, when it comes time to address the jury instructions, Mr. Freilich will have to address, I think it's instruction 315. I, I think that's the instruction about... Um, that I could give to the jury potentially about, um, and I'm not sure if it's in your packet, but um, we'll certainly take it up. It's an instruction about um, instructing the jury that they're not to hold uh, her decision not to testify against her, and that's another choice that she will have to make. If it's not in the packet, I'll get it for you, Mr. Fralick, but I'm sure you've done enough trials, you're aware of that instruction, and I'll make sure it's available to you, and we'll have that conversation later, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Very good. Um, I'm satisfied, therefore, that uh, Ms. Shabiznes is choosing not to testify. Um, then what we do is we'll bring the jury back in. Um, I'll ask Mr. Fralick if he has any other witnesses. Mr. Fralick, based upon the representations he's made, is going to indicate that he's going to rest. And then we have a, a choice really to make as to how far we want to go today um, with the jury sitting here, either try to press forward or to, um, to uh, release the jury and um, work on the jury instructions and start tomorrow with uh, instructions and closing arguments. Does the state have a preference as to either of those, Mr. Saunders? Uh, our preference would be to proceed today. 
Any objection to that, Mr. Freilich? My preference would be to go with the jury instructions today and proceed tomorrow with opening or with closing statements. Okay. Well, um, I can tell you that I don't have to make that decision right at this minute. I'm going to bring the jury in. We're going to finish up the case, and we'll go from there, and then I'll let you know what I've decided as far as that goes. All rise for the jury. Be seated. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, the case is still with the defense, so I'm going to turn to Mr. Freilich. Mr. Freilich, do you have uh, any other witnesses you wish to call? Your Honor, no other witnesses. Defense rests. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, the defense has rested, so the evidentiary portion of this portion of the trial is now concluded. Um, just to give you a little bit of a, of a roadmap as to uh, what occurs now, um, the attorneys and I need to work a little bit on finalizing the instructions that I need to give you regarding the law. Then the attorneys would do closing arguments, uh, and then you would go into deliberations. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to excuse you again, um, and I'm going to start working on these jury instructions with the attorneys. I'm not thinking it's going to take us too long, but probably longer than the other breaks you've had. But uh, that's what's going on. Progress is being made. Um, and I'm hoping that within a half hour, maybe slightly more than that, you'll have a better sense of, of the, the timing for the rest of today. Um, if I run into problems, perhaps I would dismiss you for today. But at this point, I'm thinking that I'm going to have you wait, and uh, we'll get into instructions and closing arguments today. So that's a bit of a roadmap going forward. But with that, I'm going to excuse you again. All rise for the jury whether to move forward today or for a break, send the jury home early and then come back tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm always keeping in mind just the timing that we gave them overall that this trial would take about a week. I'm concerned, I, I don't know the duration of the next phase of this trial, I'm concerned that if we come back and finish this piece tomorrow, I don't know how long deliberations will go. Um, on the first phase, and then we have the second phase. So I'm not inclined to, uh, to stop at this point. I'm inclined to, to push forward. Um, and having said that then, I think my judicial assistant should have put on your uh, tables uh, copies of the proposed jury instructions and verdict forms. Uh, Mr. Saunders, did you get a copy of those? I did. Mr. Freilich? Yes. Okay. Then what I'd like to do is just go through with you um, the, uh, those instructions, there are going to need to be some modifications, which my judicial assistant and I will work on when we break. But um, starting out with, uh, I would propose giving jury instruction 100. I will note that uh, I'm going to jump way to the end uh, after starting at the beginning that instruction 602 is instruction after evidence has been received on issue of guilt, where a plea of not guilty has been joined with a plea of not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect, it's suggested that this portion or that this piece, this instruction, be inserted to uh, instruction 100 or given following the instruction on the offense charged. My inclination is to put it right at the end of 100 because in my mind, that's where it makes most sense. Any objection to that, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Freilich? No. Okay. Then I would intend on giving 103 evidence to find. Um, then I would intend on giving also 115, one defendant, three counts. There's a couple of modifications that need to be made here. First of all, on the version that you have, I've used the initials SRT for Mr. Therian 
And I think we already talked about that way back when we were picking the jury, that we were just going to insert shad theory, and that's what I would propose to do. In fact, I've already told my judicial assistant to make that change. Any objection to that, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fraley? No, Your Honor. All right. The other thing that I'm not sure if it was corrected on your version, I think it was, and I'll, I'll raise this issue, the, the criminal complaint had the date here as February 22nd, whereas the information had February 23rd. The first draft that I looked at that I, I had my judicial assistant work on had February 22nd. We changed it to the 23rd. I just want to make sure, I think in, in your copy that you have, it should say the 23rd. I just want to make sure that that's the date we're looking at. Mine that's says the February 22nd. Yeah, it, it, says, it says the 22nd? Yes. Okay, yeah. so here's what happened. I made the changes in the version that she gave me. She didn't correct it in the version she gave you. But I'm aware of that issue. It's, it's not something like, my God, I, I'm not expecting that we're getting all these typos. I, I knew about that issue. That's why I'm raising it. Um, I fixed it in every other time I've read it to the jury. I had it as the 23rd because that's what the information says. But the first time that these proposed instructions were drafted for me to start reviewing was before we even selected a jury I was working on these, and it said the 22nd. So I had her change it, but clearly that didn't happen in your version. It should be the 23rd, Mr. Saunders, am I correct? No, um, it should be the 22nd. Okay. Um, Tuesday the 22nd. Uh, the draft we have says Wednesday the 22nd. Um, I, I think I think the information's right. The criminal complaint was in error, and that's the state filed an amended criminal complaint fixing that date. Um, in any event, I think based on the testimony, um, it should be February 22nd. So now I'm wondering if, uh, if I was mistaken because I recall at the time I was preparing my initial instructions to give to the jury, I asked my judicial assistant to check with the information and make sure that the date that in, I instructed comported with that. So now I'm thinking she changed your versions and I'm looking at the old version because mine says the 23rd but yours actually has the right date. So I think the 22nd, because that is in the, in, that's in the information, that's the instruction that I gave to the jury at the beginning. So we'll use the 22nd. Any objection to that, Mr. Fraley? That's your, what the information says. Your Honor, just from my perspective, um, I'm looking at a criminal complaint that was filed on March 1st of 2022, and the charging date is Wednesday, February 23rd of 2022. Um, you know, it's confusing. It's 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 complicated because we don't know the exact date when this may or may not have occurred. Was it February twenty second, February twenty third? I I don't know. Sure. There's a couple of things I'd respond to that, uh, Mr. Fralick. Um, first thing I'd respond to that is the information is the charging document, not the criminal complaint. Um, that's the first thing I'd say. The other thing I'd say is, um, instruction 255, which has been proposed to me, is the instruction stating, state need not prove exact date of commission. We'll get to that in a minute, but I'm satisfied that the charging document is the one we need to follow, because that's the official charging document, as opposed to the criminal complaint. So I, I don't know what was heard, at the preliminary hearing in this case, or what the waiver was to, but that's what the charging document says. Your Honor, just to, uh, the court probably already knows this, I just want to make a record. The, the criminal complaint does have February 23rd of 2022 as the charging date, filed on March 1st of 2022, Brown County, uh, Wisconsin. And then the, the information, which is the charging document, that has a different date, February 22nd of 2022, and that was filed June 2nd of 2022. For me, it's it's a little bit um, different because I wasn't the lawyer at that time. It was Attorney Jolly, but I'm just noting that all for the record. 
What and to what end? Are you asking me for something? Well, I mean, if the state thought it was on the 23rd and then they change it to the 22nd, it would appear to me that it's not clear what date this allegedly happened. Okay. Well, what I'm indicating to you is that the charging document is the one that's going to be uh, accurately reflected in the instructions. Um, and I'm also noting 255, which we'll get to in a minute, addresses this very issue. So uh, I'm going to change. Um, I'm not sure if that's a, an official objection, Mr. Freilich, to, and, and I'm not sure what you're uh, suggesting. But the, the instruction 115 is going to have Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022, in the city of Green Bay, Brown County, Wisconsin. And then where it indicates SRT, it's going to say Shad Therian. Then, um, so 115 contains 110, first degree intentional homicide. It contains uh, 1193, mutilating a corpse. Um, and in that particular uh, instruction, we need to look at the element uh, piece. And um, it would seem to me that the word that has been utilized in this case is uh, dismembered, but um, we have to make a, a, a uh, alternative selection. Um, Mr. Saunders? Yeah, I, I have no objection to that. Okay, dismembered. Mr. Freelich, dismembered. Are you asking to, whether to use mutilated, disfigured, or dismembered? Yes. Uh, can I have a minute to confer with my client? Yes, we would agree with dismembered. Okay. That, Your Honor, that last comment was an objection, just let, to let you know. Then um, the other uh, selection we need to make there is in the very next sentence, this requires that the defendant acted with the purpose to <clears throat> conceal a crime or avoid apprehension, prosecution, or conviction of a crime. Um, so, Mr. Saunders, does the state have a specific request? I think conceal a crime fits the facts best. So. Mr. Freilich? Agreed. Okay. Conceal a crime will be the alternative we'll select in uh, instruction 1193. Then we move on to count three. That's instruction 1218A, third degree sexual assault, sexual intercourse without consent. Again, the changes from SRT to Shad Therian will be made, although uh, there aren't any other alternative selections that need to be made. So that instruction will be changed. You'll get a chance to review the final version, and then uh, that's the one that I would give. Moving on, I would propose to give instruction 140, burden of proof and presumption of innocence. 145, information, not evidence. 147, improper questions. 148, objections of counsel, evidence received over objection. 150, stricken testimony. There was very little stricken testimony, but I, I think on only one occasion did I strike any testimony, but I'm going to give 150 because I think it's appropriate. 155, exhibits I will give. 157, remarks of counsel I'll give. Um, there's 158. Uh, I've already given that at various times, so I will not give that again. That's recording played to a jury, and it's supposed to be done at the time, and we did that, so I won't give it again. 160, closing arguments of counsel. I will give that one. Next one is 170, circumstantial evidence. And then the, what I direct the attorney's attention to is the bowl or the uh, capitalized instruction indicating that if evidence of flight, escape, or concealment has been admitted, see instruction 172. That's included here. Uh, I would propose to give both instruction 170 and 172. Any objection to that, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Freilich? No, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, on 172, we need to make some selections. Uh, the first line, evidence has been presented relating to the defendant's conduct after the alleged crime was committed or after the defendant was accused of the crime. I think the first option is the appropriate one. Mr. Saunders? I agree. Mr. Freilich? I agree. All right. Option one will be selected. 
Okay, moving on, 180. There needs to be some work on that. I intend to give 180. The uh, capitalized portion of the instruction indicates, add the following if a statement resulting from an unrecorded custodial interrogation is admitted at trial for a felony and no exception applies. I, I don't think that applies in this case because although there was custodial interrogation that was offered, it wasn't unrecorded. In fact, it was entirely recorded. So I think I take that paragraph out, but then continue on with the bottom paragraph. Any objection to that, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fralick? Taking off that bottom paragraph where it says continue with the following in all cases, you want to no. excise the, the, that? The, no, 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 no. The portion that says continue with the following in all cases, I would give it because, well, this is a part of all cases. The paragraph I would excise is the one just before it where it starts it is the policy of this state to make an audio or audio and visual recording. I'd take that paragraph out. In, in the brackets? Yes. Okay, I have no objection to that. Okay. Then um, I'll move on. I'll give 190 weight of evidence, 195 jurors knowledge. I would give uh, 200 expert testimony general. So there's some selections that need to be made there or at least addressed. It says, continue with the following if experts have given conflicting testimony. I, I don't think that's the case, so I would propose to delete that portion. Any objection, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fralick? And the, the bottom bracket as well, the two brackets? Right, that's the part that they're saying, continue with the following. I'm just asking if you're going to take those out. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay. 255, this is the one state need not prove exact date of commission, specific date alleged. Uh, that essentially says if you find that the offense charge was committed by the defendant, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the offense was committed on the precise date alleged in the information. If the evidence shows beyond a reasonable doubt that the offense was committed on a date near the date alleged, that is sufficient. Um, you're asking for that, Mr. Saunders? Yes. Mr. Fralick, any objection? Well, it's kind of a conundrum because they file a criminal complaint with one date, then they file the information, which is the charging document, with a different date, but then they're saying they don't have to prove the exact date. So I'm kind of confused on that, Your Honor. So I have lodged an objection to that. Okay, I'm going to give <clears throat> 255. I'm satisfied that the date in the information is the date that needs to be uh, instructed because that's the charging document, but I'm also satisfied that this is an appropriate um, instruction to give in light of, frankly, the entirety of the evidence that I've heard. I'm satisfied that, um, <clears throat> frankly, given that the, the timing, the, the, the time of day that's occurring, that knowing when one day flipped to the next uh, may not be so easy to pin down. So I'm satisfied this is an appropriate instruction. I'm going to give that as revised. I'm then going to give 300 credibility of witnesses. There is an option at the end that says give the following paragraph only when the defendant testifies. Given that the defendant didn't testify, I would propose to delete that and end the, the bracketed paragraph just below it. And uh, But then continue on with the last paragraph indicating there is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony. Any objection to that, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fralick? No, Your Honor. Okay. Moving on, 325, impeachment of witness, prior conviction, or juvenile adjudication. I don't think anyone was asked that question, and I don't think anybody was impeached with a prior conviction. So I propose to take 325 out. Mr. Saunders, any objection? No. Mr. Fralick? I agree. Okay, that'll be out. Thank you. 327, impeachment of defendant as witness, prior conviction, or a juvenile adjudication. The defendant didn't testify. I propose to take that out. Any objection, Mr. Saunders? No. Mr. Fralick? No, Your Honor. That'll be out. 460, closing instruction, I would propose to give that. Then I would propose uh, 484, verdict submitted for one defendant, three counts, separate verdict on each count required. Um, I would propose to give 515, unanimous verdict and selection of presiding juror. And that's it. Um, so... We'll, you'll have another opportunity to look at these after I've made those revisions, but such as they are, uh, Mr. Saunders, any objection to the entirety of those instructions or anything I'm missing or that you'd like me to add? Yeah, uh, 
two additions that I'd propose. I, I Madam Clerk, do it for the copies. Okay, I have one for the for the board. So The first is based on some testimony that we heard. Um, it would be our request to make clear that voluntary intoxication is not a defense um, in the case. There's not a pattern jury instruction that really says that. There's a part of 755A that does have that sentence. And I, I, the state would ask that just that sentence be read, given the state of the law and in the state of the uh, voluntary intoxication defense. So you're saying this is coming out of 755A? Correct. It's not directly applicable, but as modified, I believe it's accurate. Let's take a look at it. Yes. Any response uh, to their request for 755A? Just, just so you know, Mr. Frelick, and I know you don't have the benefit of having your computer sitting right in front of you regarding 755A. 755A is an instruction that is entitled as follows. Involuntary intoxication or drug condition. So it looks as if... Um, Mr. Saunders has utilized that pattern instruction. Mr. Saunders, if I'm correct, you've utilized that pattern instruction to craft this, and he's proposing that this be given. Any objection to that? No, Your Honor. Okay. I know the law. Okay. So um, that's fine. We will. I will. Uh, I will give this modified 755A. Generally, I, uh, other than sometimes rearranging where the closing instruction goes, I give these in numerical order, that would put it right at the end. I, I don't propose to put it right at the end because it, the last one I generally give is 515, unanimous verdict and selection of a presiding juror. I, I think that is the best to have at the end. Um, proposal as to where we uh, insert it, Mr. Uh, Saunders? I would say um, right after the uh, 115, the substantive jury instructions, I think that makes sense. Any objection to inserting it there, Mr. Freilich, right after 115, the substantive instructions? Your Honor, if I could just have a minute. Yes, that makes sense. Okay. Very good. Okay, we've taken that one up then. Um, before I move on, do you have a Word document with these on it that I you do. can forward to my judicial assistant? Okay. Uh, one Thank of you, so that because I'm going to be heading over there shortly to finish these off and we'll need it. Um, but let's let's look at, you, you don't have to do that till we're, till we're done, but... Um, Let's look at your other request then, Mr. Saunders. Yeah, so obviously that issue or this issue has been uh, addressed in, in litigation. There's a motion to dismiss um, regarding uh, the state doesn't need to prove that a, a crime victim was alive or deceased at the time of uh, the sexual intercourse. Um, and I, I think the state just envisioned a jury having that question given the two elements don't clearly explain what I think is an accurate statement of the law. Uh, so our, our request would be to add something uh, to address that issue, because obviously it's the facts and uh, circumstances that the state's alleging in this case. Okay. Well, let me just, uh, before I turn to Mr. Freilich, uh, to take a look at, uh, at his position on this, um, I'm just going to pull up the statute. Because we did have this issue that was raised as uh, at the motion hearing on June 13th. This was, this was heard by the court. Um, and I know I, at that point I denied a motion to dismiss that count. 
And the assertion in that motion was um, that, that had been filed by the defense that, that really the, the charge should be dismissed because um, at the time the alleged victim was deceased. And then we looked at the statute. Okay, and I know it, uh, so the, the, um, the instruction, the one that I'm proposing to give in any event that everybody's agreed to, 1218A, um, references the statute, 940.225 sub 3 sub A. And um, so I've looked at that statute, and under 940.225, sub 7, it indicates specifically this section applies whether a victim is dead or alive at the time of the sexual contact or sexual intercourse. Okay, so what you're proposing that be done in this case because of issues that have been raised and frankly that were um, argued on, um, on that date, that it be inserted, that the following language be inserted Quote, it is immaterial whether Shad Therian is dead or alive at the time of the sexual intercourse, close quote. That's what you're asking to be added? Yes. Mr. Freilich, any objection to that language? Your Honor, I know that the, the jury instruction says person. What about the statute? Um, <clears throat> you know, what we have here, and not to be crass, but human remains, you know, body parts that are in different locations. So that was the issue that I had with that. I'm, I'm sorry, your, your question, what the, 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 you said that the statute says person? Well, I know the jury instruction says person, but the, I don't know if the statute says that, but it talks about any part of a person's body. So it talks about a person, and what we have here is, you know, a, a body part, body parts. Statute says 3A, says as follows. Whoever has sexual intercourse with a person without the consent of that person is guilty of a class... You know, it's, it's guilty of a felony. So um, the, the instruction mirrors the statute as far as person. So when you get down to sub 7 where it says this section applies whether a victim is dead or alive at the time of the sexual contact or sexual intercourse, they're using the word person, or using the word victim instead of person in sub 7, presumably, because um, at that point in time, um, at that point in time, using the word person could get confusing as to whether you're talking about a victim or a perpetrator. If you just said, the section applies whether a person is dead or alive, can you perpetrate I don't, I don't want to get into all the machinations, but it would seem as if the word victim is used in that in sub seven, uh, perhaps for that reason. So the question, of course, is uh, whether there's an objection to insertion of the language, it is immaterial whether Shad Therian is dead or alive at the time of the sexual intercourse. Any objection to that? I, I know that's in the statute, but is that in the pattern jury instruction that we have, Your Honor? It is not. It's not. He's asking so for it to be added he, in. Yeah, he wants to add something, correct? Yes. I'm going to object to that. Okay. Um, I'm satisfied that, first of all, adding that language in is a correct statement of the law. It, it, it is. Um, it, it's not as if uh, modifying the instruction uh, to something that incorrectly outlines what the law is. It's just an accurate statement of the law. Secondly, this is a bit of an um, of unusual circumstance where... Typically, when you see these uh, assaults occur, you have someone in court testifying that they were the victim of a sexual assault. That's different, of course, when you have uh, someone who is, who is deceased. So, so the circumstances of this case are, are a little bit unique. Um, it's already been 
put into this case. It was argued, and, and uh, I'm satisfied that it's an appropriate addition in this particular case. Um, these pattern jury instructions are not by any means mandated by law to be used. They're, they're guides, and while we usually follow them, uh, it's certainly permissible for courts to look at them and modify them as needed, and I think this is an appropriate addition. So I'm going to grant that request. And so that will be added to instruction 115, the subpart under 1218A. Anything else, Mr. Saunders? No, thank you. All right, Mr. Fralick, again, you're going to get a final opportunity to review these, but any um, additions or uh, changes that you're looking for besides what we've already discussed? No, Your Honor, thank you very much. Okay. Um, let me just uh, ask you then about the proposed verdict forms. Obviously, there are three counts. There will be six verdict forms. One for guilty and one for not guilty for each count. Mr. Saunders, have you had an opportunity to review those? Yes. Right. Changes or corrections on those? Uh, no. Mr. Fralick? Uh, one moment, please. Your Honor, I have reviewed uh, all the verdict forms. They appear to be in proper order. Okay. My judicial assistant and I are going to get underway on these right away. Mr. Saunders, if you can make sure you send a word a version over to her. Um, I invite the attorneys to get up and move around if you want, but don't get far because as soon as I'm done, I want to get back on the record, and I don't know how long it's going to take me. So um, uh, just stay close, but you can certainly move about the courthouse, okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we're in recess. You're listening to True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast continuous coverage of the trial of Taylor's a business nightmare in Wisconsin. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our continuing coverage. More raw trial audio next.